If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi, welcome to the Dance Resource Podcast. My name is Alexa Lopez. I am your host. Today we have a special guest. Terry Wilson is here. <laughs> Hi, Terry. <laughs> Hi, how you doing, Alexa? I'm good. How about um, you? My name's oh good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna say, Terry? Well, I was just gonna introduce myself that way if you want. Okay. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Okay, go ahead. so I'm Terry Wilson. Yeah, I've been dancing in San Diego since around 1981. And um, I'm 58, so I've been in the community for a really long time. But before that, I was um, I lived in Michigan, and before that, I lived in Canada. I'm Canadian, um, and I moved to California when I was 17, and I wanted to be a doctor, and then I became a professor of dance. <laughs> so we'll kind of unpack that today. So I'm a professor of dance at San Diego City College. I'm a lecturer um, at UCSD. I've been working at UCSD since 1989, a long time. I've been working at City since 1997. And um, <clears throat> I am a board member of San Diego Dance Theater and moving into associate artistic director uh, ship of the company um, as we move out of COVID-19, fingers crossed. So that's my title. <laughs> and I'm a mother and a wife. <laughs> 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 All right, Terry, um, today um, we're going to talk about how dancers age. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and <laughs> the reason why I um, decided on this topic is because I feel like when I look at your professional dance life, I feel like that's like something that a lot of um, dancers in the field want to achieve. So I just want to get like your insight um, on how dancers kind of go through age, through the ages, uh, because I feel like yeah. as a professional dancer, you you go through different stages of your dance life that um, a lot of people don't know about. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the first one of the questions that you were asking me about. Um, was what age did I begin dancing? And I think this has something to do with that mm -hmm. because I didn't dance as a young girl. Um, I didn't take classes. Um, there was one winter in Michigan <laughs> that was very cold. And um, so my mom signed me up to these classes that were happening in the basement of the um, of a church in, in my little town in Michigan, Dexter, Michigan. And so every Saturday from nine to one, I would go and we would do tapping and we would do some jazz and we'd do some ballet and we'd do some tumbling. And um, I did that for about, I don't know, six months and we did a little recital, but that's the only training and dance that I had as a young girl. Um, two of my best friends um, used to take ballet in Ann Arbor, Michigan with Mr. McCush. <laughs> <laughs> and I was very jealous because they could wear point shoes and tutus and things like that, but my family couldn't afford it. Um, the one girlfriend's dad owned the yacht club and the other girlfriend's dad was a doctor. Mm. So I would go and sit in the gallery and watch my two friends dance. And I never was able to do that. And so, um, but um, I think part of the question of aging is that I was an athlete in high school. I was an all conference athlete in the seventies, um, which doesn't really say much because the, the way the athletes are now, they're just amazing. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I was quite good at sports. Um, and very physical. And I would say that um, I would probably be labeled ADD, which we didn't have those labels then, because I was hard, it was hard for me to sit still most of the time. So sports really helped me with that, mm -hmm. um, which I think links up with, you know, the whole movement aspect of being able to dance and move most of the day versus 
sitting in a chair like I've doing, <laughs> been doing lately. Um, so uh, when I got to California, I was 17 and I um, needed to get my residency so I could go to college for free at that time. It was free and, or $50 for a semester. Mm. That's, that's $50. Plus books. That's it. Wow. <laughs> I know, right? And so um so when I finally got my residency and got into college, it was about nineteen eighty one. So it took me a couple of years to get grounded in San Diego, get a job, get an apartment, not in that order, but sort of. And then, you know, get my residency and then start college. So I started a little bit later, I was twenty one or twenty, something like that, when I started college and I went to Palomar community college up at, in, in San Marcos. And mm. I thought, I miss being a p- part of something that was movement oriented. I miss being on a team. I miss being a part of something. So I think this leads into other conversations that we would have is that dance creates a community and so does do athletics. So mm-hmm. I wanted to take a ballet class. So I took a ballet class um, at Palomar and I fell in love. And um, I also took a tennis class in in high school, I won the tennis championship, uh, the female female tennis championship. Oh wow! So I thought, oh, I'll just pick that up again. <laughs> yeah, I was a good athlete in high school, and I can't I can't seem to do any of that stuff anymore. Oh but <laughs> anyway, <laughs> there's an aging piece. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I took the ballet class, and I took a tennis court class, and I took you know my GED and stuff like that. And I wanted to become a doctor. I wanted to be a psychiatrist. I wanted to go through medical school and then go into a, a psychology. Um, uh, <clears throat> focus. And that's kind of what I always wanted to do. So dance wasn't even in the conversation, except that I felt like I wanted to try it because I felt I missed out on it. And Palomar was $50 for all my classes. So <laughs> that was really fun. And that, that experience at Palomar changed my life, which I think also binds some of me with my um, community college students that I have at City College, because they they can see that I'm an example of somebody who starts late and then mm-hmm. becomes successful. <clears throat> so the other piece, I guess, is um, about how dancers age. Um, I think it's really important to know your own body and to not give the power out to the doctor or your mother, even like your mother's going to know, your mother and father are going to know a lot about your body, but each person's physiology is different. And I think mm-hmm. understanding that and understanding the rhythms and cycles of your body and your ups and your downs in your mood swings and in your energy um, is really important to keep yourself from getting injured. Mm-hmm. And I've seen many, many dancers that were better than I was, you know, legs forever and <laughs> definitely better than I was, but they, there's something in their physiology that made them injury prone. Um, and I really don't know. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm blessed with a stronger sort of, constitution that way I I didn't ex- experience an injury until I was 39 years old mm. and it was pretty extreme mm. it changed my life and changed my body <laughs> but um yeah so I think I was pretty lucky um I didn't I didn't sustain any injuries as a young dancer or through my career until I was you know almost done with my career so I really think that each person if they really want to have a dance career need to have a really strong relationship with themselves and what really feeds them, you know, I know like there's a lot of people that are trying to lose weight and, you know, have different kinds of diets and things like that. But the food that you eat gives you the power that you need to be a dancer. Um, So some people are vegan, some people are vegetarian, some people eat meat. Um, I eat meat and when I eat meat, I can feel a difference in my power. So I, I don't eat it a lot, but I can see a difference. So I would say having that sensitivity to what really fuels you nutritionally is really important to sustain the quality of the tissue to keep, you know, thing, injuries from happening, the strength from happening. So, yeah. and also um, training, right? Obviously training, but cross training, not just doing, I was a runner when I was younger. I've done triathlons. So I was, very, I've been very physical a good chunk of my life, sort of balancing out that repetition of big <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'm going on. So, <laughs> uh, take Terry, over. <laughs> so, um, I cannot remember, but did you have um, your bachelor's in psychology or do you do a double major? Double. Double? Okay. So um, this, this, is a, this is not a good story for students, but um, <laughs> I, I went to Palomar with an, to get an AA degree transfer and I ended up getting an AA in dance with a transfer to San Diego State. And then I 
went to state to study psychology, but I also took classes with uh, uh, at, in the dance program at San Diego State. And I studied with Gene Isaacs, George Willis, Pat Sambag, Melissa Nunn, um, uh, Wayne Davis was my ballet teacher from California Ballet. Um, trying to think. But I took all those classes anyway, sort of paralleling. Um, and then I met a boy and I fell in love with a boy <laughs> and he was going to Santa Barbara. So I transferred to Santa Barbara, UCSB and pursued dance there and then came back and finished my uh, BS. And <laughs> oh, hi. Um, we got cut off um, for a second, but we're back on. So Terry, you left off. At, you fell in love. <laughs> I fell in love with a man who was going to Santa Barbara, UCSB. So I left state and went to Santa Barbara and I did a dance degree there. I did five quarters um, and I'm one class shy of getting a BA in dance from UCSB. So I technically do not have a degree from Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. but in my heart, I did the work. I just, I'm missing that one class and I don't do that. Finish your degree. <laughs> then I came back to San Diego after that and uh, started back at state to finish my psych degree, which I did finish in 1997. And that same year, or sorry, 1987, 1986, I, I started in Jean's company. And the company that she was directing at that time was called Three's Company and Dancers, which was directed by Jean Isaac, Betsy uh, Rowe Weinberg, and Patrick Nolay. That's the three, Three's Company, <laughs> and they their company was pretty much the only modern dance company, I think, in San Diego. I think, I'm not gonna, don't quote me on that, but it was started <laughs> in 1974. So I started about 12 years after that, but then very quickly after I joined her company, the company name changed from Three's Company and Dancers to Isaacs, McCaleb and Dancers. Oh. <clears throat> so Jean Isaacs, Nancy McCaleb were the two co-artistic directors of that company. And I danced for them for like eight years. Um, oh, wow. And finished my degree in psychology. And then, um, and a lot of stuff changed. So I'll <laughs> leave that there. <laughs> so what advice will you give a young dancer when they're uh, searching for programs, dance programs at mm -hmm. universities and, um, or colleges, if that, that's what they want to do? Well, it's a good question. Um, it's a very, very good question. And, um, I put myself through college. I'm about $2,000 away from get being loan free. So I'm really excited about that. That'll be a big party. <laughs> um, but I also went through that with my daughter, you know, when she was, cho after she went out of high school, she was choosing which college to go to. And I can't stress enough that you find a, a good fit. And mm -hmm. what does that mean? It means culture. It means chemistry. It means feeling like you belong. Um, there's a connection to the faculty, who they are as people and what they've done with their career, specifically in dance. Like, you know, what had they, what got them to where they are as a professor mm -hmm. in dance, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I think it's difficult to connect directly to your passion when you're a young person coming out of high school because everything's so open and you're just supposed to know everything. And I, mm -hmm. I don't think that's very good advice. I think mm -hmm. that you, but that a young person has an opportunity to explore. Now, that being said, when I got out of high school, you know, no one could tell me what to do. I mean, I was a typical 17 year old rebellious girl <laughs> moving to California eight days after graduation from high school. I got on that plane to LA and I never went back. I mean, to visit, yeah, but I never <laughs> li lived in Michigan again. That's not true. I, I lived there for two years when I got my MFA. But anyway, that's true. <laughs> um, you know, I was very, uh, you know, I knew that I had to take care of myself. I didn't have money coming from anywhere else. And so um, it was a different climate. When when students go to college now, they have pathways that they're directed to by counselors and you're supposed to know what you want to do. So I would always say to balance, uh, you know, you have to do your research mm -hmm. and you have to find that fit. And for dance students specifically, <clears throat> understanding who the faculty are that comprise the department there and the kinds of things that they do much easier to research now because you can see you know samples of work on YouTube and other places like that you can read their biographies when I went to college that was definitely not the case so um, but I didn't take classes until I knew 
that that class, that teacher was the best teacher for that class. It didn't matter if it was biology, psychology, or modern dance. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to take, I didn't want to waste my time or my money taking classes from teachers that were not popular and, and were not, I didn't connect with. That mm -hmm. made a huge difference for me because I was paying for every dime of it. I wasn't going to go and take a class just because I needed that class with some shitty professor. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> edit that out <laughs> sorry we didn't have rate your back then either so it was just word of mouth right mm -hmm. so I had to talk to people and see what was going on but I I just I kind of custom tailored my my college education which I don't know is really available to students right now because they kind of funnel you through mm -hmm. so what you can do as a young person going into college is you can research you know where you're going if you go to um a college that really focuses on ballet and the technique of ballet, you're going to get the culture of ballet when you go there. If that's mm -hmm. what you want to do. Uh, there are lots of lots of undergraduate programs that are really well balanced um, with the different genres of dance, and then specialty classes as you come, become a junior and senior. Um, I think it's also hard to know um, as a young person if you want to be a choreographer or do you want to dance professionally or do you want to be a teacher. Or do you want to do all of those things? Do you want to own your own uh, studio, run mm -hmm. your own studio? That's a whole nother conversation about business, right? Mm -hmm. You know these things. Um, so, so part of it's like who that person is, what they want to do, and then looking at where they might be going and the culture that's happening there to see if they would have a good fit. Um, that's incredibly important. My daughter, she when she was uh, she was not happy. Uh, well, she was first she was very happy and then she was not very happy because the sort of con culture that she was in in college was in the beginning seemed really great. And then when the actual like going deep into the study and the work it was it wasn't what she wanted. And mm -hmm. so it's really important and it's much more difficult, I think, for students to know that. A lot of times dancers start when they're little and they know that that's where they're going to head. Um, that's a different thing entirely. Right. I didn't know that I was going to become a doctor. <laughs> so I always laugh when I say that because <laughs> I'm kind of far away from that. <laughs> I'm an artist <laughs> and that's great. So bal balancing out that, that science part of me, uh, I still have the, fa the, the whole um, fascination with the way the body runs. And, and that's really important, I think, as a dancer, too, which uh, connects to the aging yeah. component. Yeah. Okay. Um. So what are some type of classes that dancers can expect from a college? I mean, I know that every uh, yeah. college kind of has their own, like, yeah. uh, expertises. But yeah. Yeah. in general, like, what would they expect? Well, okay. So, again, that kind of goes back to, you know, what the background is. So I didn't mm -hmm. have a background in dance. Of course, I wanted to do the ballet thing because my girlfriends did. But I mean, I took modern and I was like, this is my place, <laughs> right? I, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was just a no brainer. Um, I walked into uh, the Three's Company uh, studio on Fifth Avenue, which is torn down now. Oh. And I was, it was right between Palomar. I finished Palomar and I was starting state. It was the summer of 1983 which also is the summer that flash dance came out and everybody was cutting <laughs> off the necks and their shoulders and necks were hanging out <laughs> and that's covered <laughs> leg warmers and French cut <laughs> leotard, you know, <laughs> that was that summer. And I walked into the studio where Jean was teaching and she said, Oh, who are you? I was with my girlfriend, Debbie Griffin. And she goes, who are you? And I, I said, well, I'm Terry, this is Debbie. And, we want to come in and she goes, do you want to go and do the summer workshop? And I said, sure. And so she never met me before, never seen me dance, gave Debbie and I full scholarships to the summer workshop. Oh, wow. Um, and that was like a magical moment in my life. So that's the question I can't answer for everybody is that how to be in the right place at the right time. That was for <laughs> me a big turning point. And, um, that may be another podcast because that could be a movie the way that worked out. It was a <laughs> wonderful, su wonderful summer and we danced and I had no idea what I was doing. And I have photographs <laughs> to blackmail myself with. I was like, ah, my shoulders were up. I was, you know, 
I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was so happy. Mm-hmm. And then that was the summer in 83. And then in the fall 83, I started at State. And Jean was my teacher there. So some people don't know that Jean taught at San Diego State. Too. I she, didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, she taught at State for many years. And then she went to UCSD and taught there for many years and mm-hmm. then retired. So, um, yeah, I forgot what the question is. It was... Oh, types of class. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right. So um, if you don't have a specialty, then you would want to go to a program that's got a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of community colleges are like that. They have a nice broad base. Okay. We have a nice broad base. You can take tap, you can take hip hop, you can take jazz, you can take modern, you can take ballet, choreography, improvisation, history of dance, dance appreciation, uh, modalities, introduction to modalities, maybe. Those mm-hmm. are going to be sort of, you know, the bread and butter of a community college. Right. And then you if you did that, then you would move to a college that has a specialty that you would want to focus on. Could be teaching children dance, the business of having a, you know, um, business of having your own dance studio Um, could be choreography, performing um, uh, somatic modalities. So you would have to know what your where your heart is by then, like where you want to put your focus in. There are lots of universities that have a very broad based kind of thing where you can specialize in your junior and senior year. Um, And then there are other universities that have very specific focuses um, on improvisation or uh, postmodern dance or somatics. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what you want to do. And I would say that the broader base colleges are better when you're younger because it gives you more opportunity to figure out what you want to focus on. And then you can focus that on when you do your MFA or your master's degree. Um, that, that's just my opinion. Um, because if I didn't have all the choices that I had, I wouldn't have found modern. I would have stayed with ballet and I definitely would have been kicked out of that. <laughs> I didn't, I'm five two. I don't have a ballet body. And, you know, I just would have been doing it for um, personal pleasure versus excelling into um, a degree. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I would say, you know, the broad based college programs are really important. And then, you know, as you get more mature and understand more what your focus is on, then you can start choosing course colleges that have that, that specificity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So you mentioned how you met Jean Isaacs and I'm yeah. curious, how did you get the opportunity to actually dance with her professionally? Oh, okay. So um, there were a bunch of us that are still, most of us are still in San Diego. Most of us dance professionally and most of us are teaching college dance right now. So that, that kind of speaks to some of the other questions that you have. We, um, we became the solid foundation of what San Diego the dance community was. Um, okay. So so how did this go? Um, all right. It was a lot of stuff happens in the summer workshop. Okay. Summer workshops are so important. I remember the moment in my life when Pat Sandback from San Diego state told me you can no longer take summers off. Cause one summer I was like, I'm not dancing this summer. And she said, mm, you want to dance, you have to dance all the time. And that was the last time I took any day time off except for to have the baby, <laughs> my child <laughs> in 94. So, um, so that summer, Oh, I, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, in that summer workshop, there were a bunch of dancers. We were all at state together, um, dancing and performing, doing you know concerts at San Diego State. We were all friends. And that summer, um, I met. I decided to go up to Santa Barbara with this young boy, and um, I missed that opportunity. Hmm. When I came back, those people, my friends, were already in the company. They'd gotten invited to be in the company. And um, so I missed the boat. <laughs> if I had stayed, I would have been invited in probably 85, 80, you know, that, that era. Um, so I came back and um, there was a woman that was in the company and she'd, she'd gotten in a car wreck. Oh, no. um, and uh, I, Jean asked me to take her place in one of these projects. And that's how I got in. And it was, it was a hard time because she was a friend of mine. She was a lovely dancer, you know, and it just, the timing, I don't, you know, she never really recovered from that car accident. She got hit pretty hard and um, she still managed to be involved in dance, but her heart was on stage and her body couldn't do it. And so that's kind of a, a I was just, you know, 
I was there. And ironically, I was ready to leave because I wasn't in the company and I decided I might want to go to another city and try to pursue dance there after graduating from Santa Barbara. And the car accident happened. So Jean said, can you stay and fill in for this woman's part? And then I, that's kind of how I, then I was in the company basically. So if that's not a good story. I mean, we're kind of still friends, but she doesn't live in San Diego anymore, but that's, a, you know, another situation where you're, in the right place at the wrong time or whatever you want to say <laughs> kind of thing. So, um, yeah. So that's um, how I got into the company. Okay, Terry. Um, so what are some, uh, things that you learned both artistically and personally by working alongside with Gene Isaacs? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, well, uh, the Gene Isaacs, of that time was a very passionate and a very um, motivated, beautiful dancer herself and choreographer, very driven, uh, very uh, consistent in offering summer workshops back in those days. It was amazing what, what she was able to do. She, every two weeks we had different artists coming in and in the summer. And then they would set, they would set work on the summer dance students in, in the company too. And then every, every two weeks we'd have a different performance from different artists. Um, that was how that, you know, that cl the culture was, is that the summer workshop, you know, the whole, the whole summer, but the summer workshops were where, you know, people came from all over the place, Switzerland, mm -hmm. Mexico, Baja, everywhere, all over from the States and stuff like that. And we would have these amazing teachers that would come in different uh, political climate in terms of finances and supporting the arts. But she has always offered that. And, um, we would have always a winter workshop between Christmas and New Year's. And um, so it was this um, drive to make sure that there was dance happening in San Diego. And um, she was pretty much the only company that paid her dancers. I never did anything for her for free, ever. The first, very first gig I did for her, I earned 50 bucks and I was dancing with Terry Shipman <laughs> in, a little, in a little Christmas thing that was happening and the company had gone, um, the professional company at that time had gone to Palm Springs to do uh, some kind of a celebration for the holidays. And there was another opportunity with the San Diego Opera, I think it was, to, to uh, be a dancer in, in that Christmas uh, pageant or something. I don't know, it was a long time ago. <laughs> and she said, here's your first paycheck as a professional dancer. And she's always paid her dancers. She's always uh, made that her priority. Um, and uh, during that time, um, dancing for her okay so there's a the chemistry piece that we talked about earlier like having chemistry with your teachers and your choreographer like dancing her work for me was very like fit my body fit my athleticism the power and the um, drive and passion that she made uh, in her choreography uh, was all always really spoke to my body as well as several other people in San Diego that stayed with her for a long time so there was a connection there. I mean, you can go and dance for choreographers and not connect to their movement, but just do it because it's a job. I just mm -hmm. happened to really connect with somebody whose movement really fit uh, what I like to do with my body. It was very athletic, very challenging, very, um, you know, you had to be really strong. And um, also she um, was very consistent. She was, uh, I, I want to say I've done close to a hundred dancers, dances of her dance like her choreography, like oh, wow. a lot, a lot of work, right? To always making dances, always presenting concerts, always creating summer workshops. So there was a, a way to keep training and a way to be consistent. And that was the company to be a part of because we were actually doing things. And in the early days, um, we would travel to New York and San Francisco a little bit and down to Mexico a lot. We went to Mexico all the time, Mexicali, Aguas Calientes, um, uh, Mazatlan, uh, later, we went to, in San Diego Dance Theater, we went to Mexico City, uh, and then we went to Switzerland almost every summer for oh, wow. five or six summers. We'd go to Switzerland and kind of do what we do in San Diego, teach <laughs> workshops and teach repertory and create concerts. Um, it was a really, really wonderful time. And, um, you know, there's climates of, you know, when, when, um, when the politics and the e economics of a, of a country are better for arts and like we're in COVID-19, it's really hard on the arts, mm -hmm. but then there's the recovery time afterwards and they infuse the arts with money. And we were able to do that 
but Gene has always written the grants and gone after that stuff and created an opportunity for the company to travel and to, um, you know, have a consistent uh, calendar, you know, a consistent um, season is what the word I'm mm-hmm. looking for. Um, yeah, and I, I would say, again, it goes back to the chemistry. We still have that chemistry today. It's a little harder right now, but we still have that strong chemistry and connection. Oh, this next question is the hardest one. <laughs> Your favorite memory about being a dancer at San Diego Dance Theater? Um, okay, so San Diego Dance Theater. I started dancing for San Diego Dance Theater in 19... La, 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 la. When was it? 98 or 99. And... Isaacs, McCaleb, and dancers disbanded in 97 or 96. I'm not quite sure about this. This is when I'm in grad school, so I'm mm-hmm. miss, not quite sure on all the history here, but um, the actual dates. But I came back to California after going to grad school, and the company had, the, the two choreographers had separated. And um, Gene took over the 501c3 San Diego Dance Theater, which was founded by George Willis. Um, I, I should know the date for this, but it was <laughs> probably late 70s. Maybe, I don't know. I'd have to look at that. Maybe even earlier. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. But um, that's been a 501c3 for many, many years. And it went dormant and had artistic directors went dormant. And so she resuscitated the 501c3, which is the nonprofit status for a dance company. Mm-hmm. And it became Gene Isaac, San Diego Dance Theater. And um, I wasn't going to come back. I was just, I came back to teach at City College. I wasn't going to get back on stage. Um, I was more interested in becoming uh, a, a teacher uh, in dance, which is why I decided to get my MFA. And um, Jean needed a dancer. She asked me if I would come back, and, and I did. And then I stayed for another six or seven years. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> my favorite memory. Um, uh, well, we went here. We went, to, um, we went and performed in New York City uh, right after 9-11 happened. Mm. That was a really interesting time to be in a dance company and to be a part of the arts in terms of such tragedy and loss. Um, And we were in the city three months after that happened. And Uh so we went there and we just, I had gotten engaged to my husband and we were going to go into New York and look at wedding dresses and stuff. Of course, I couldn't afford that kind of stuff, but, (laughs) you know, it's still kind of fun to go around and pretend like I was going to, you know, buy a wedding dress in New York City, (laughs) but it was a really magical time very sad and tragic, but we were all together. And uh, New York City in the, in the winter, if it's snowing at Christmas time, it's just, there's lights everywhere and angels everywhere. And we, we just had an amazing time. We, um, Jean and I went to dinner at Tavern on the Green, which is a famous restaurant in Central Park. Um, went to Lincoln Center and saw all the Christmas lights, performed, was wonderful. And, um, you know, it just had, uh, met with Monica Bill Barnes and then went out to dinner. It was just a really, really fun trip. And, and Jean and I particularly connected on that trip. And um, I mean, we were always really connected, but we, <laughs> we had such a good time. We were laughing so hard that we were embarrassing people because we, we were just having fun. <laughs> and, uh, there was just a lot of moments in that particular weekend. Uh, my husband's family came up from Atlantic City to watch the show. Uh, it just was a, a really special trip all things considered, you know, the political climate, this 9-11, all this stuff, just being in the city. And um, I saw some of my friends from graduate school came to see the show. Uh, This is a nice reunion. Um, Yeah, I think that was one of the highlights. Lots of, Mm -hmm. lots of very, very fun times, but that had many, (laughs) many moments in one sort of small period of time, like five days or whatever. So yeah, New York City, (laughs) uh, I would say that was, uh, yeah, 2001. Um, so what do you wish you knew before becoming an artistic performer? Ooh, well, I would say the number one thing was how scary it is. Yeah. Like the responsibility that goes with it. Mm-hmm. Um, because up until that point, it was a lot of fun for me. Right. And then when the curtains open and there's 500 people that paid money to see you dance. All of a sudden you're like, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> whoa. <laughs> You know, there's the ego part. They're coming to watch me dance. Look at me, look at me. But then there was like, there's responsibility that goes with that, right? Because once the dance is done and the costumes are on and the lights are on and the curtain opens, all the responsibility goes to the performer to do Mm -hmm. their job and to make that connection with the audience. 
And I started to take that very seriously after that, you know, looking at, um, you know, just what goes with that. You know, it's not just fun. It's not just a game. It's not just a toy. You're dancing. It's your job. And you need to go out there and um, put that out there. Mm -hmm. Be very vulnerable um, to the audience and the audience's response. So that that was a big um, wake up call for me um, in terms of being a performer. And so much so that I really re-examined if that was the arena that I wanted to be in. Did I really want to be on stage or did I just want to be, excuse me, mm -hmm. I just wanted to be um, a, a dancer in a class that augmented my life with, you know, dance studio classes and sometimes little performances, but not being in a company that knocked me back. Uh, it's called stage fright. <laughs> so <laughs> the piece of that is that you need, you need to learn to manage your energy, right? When, the, when that audience opens, that curtain opens, that energy rushes at you and all of a sudden, you know, yeah. you're managing <laughs> your own nerves and then you're managing this amount of energy and then the energy of the dancers around you. So there was a, a negotiation of energy then knocked me back. And I thought to myself, maybe, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I'm just meant to be a, a good dancer in class and just have dance be a part of my life. And I was okay with that, you know, because it was never always, that wasn't my direction. Like it just, these things happened for me. Like mm -hmm. I, my opportunities kind of built on being in the right place in the right time and having this relationship with Gene Isaac. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had to take a real good look at that. Um, and then I kind of got over it. Um, so for example, like I would take a phrase of dance, uh, a movement, and I would be the, do it really well in class. Gene would make me demonstrate it. I would just like knock it out and be really good at it. And then I would do that same phrase on, on, on stage within the context of, of a piece of choreography and only dance at 70% because the other 30% was stage fright or maybe more, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so that was what made me, I'm like, I know I can do this better than what I just did. I go walk off the stage and go, what was that? Right. <laughs> and that, so that was a big learning curve for me. And it, it really just packages up into stage fright and how you negotiate that. And then, you know, I was confronted with whether that's really what I wanted to do with my time. So I did, this is an important piece because I did perform for many, many years, but I always question what my real goal was like my real, what do what was my real, um, my, my takeaway from all these years of being in the dance studio and all these times performing, and, and, and this may come later in the, in the um, interview, is that I wanted to be a teacher. Mm. So it, it's an important thing to think about um, why you're on stage. Yeah. Is it the prestige? Is it the ego? You want everybody to look at you? Oh, okay, yeah, right? Everybody wants all that, right? <laughs> sort of. Some people are shy by nature, right? Yeah. I, I'm not shy. <laughs> but I also I also didn't dance as well as I could in those first, you know, performances when I was really a green, what we call a green dancer. By the time I was 43, I was not green anymore. And I walked out there and just knocked, knocked out the movement and walked back out and said, give me some wine. <laughs> that was my job. Like, like, go out and do your job, like, right? So anyway, um, but I think all of that stuff, there was a piece that wasn't there for me and it became evident that I really like to teach and that's what led me to get my MFA which I think is probably another question <laughs> yeah later okay, okay Terry uh how reliable can a dance performance salary salary be uh will you recommend having a side job right yes have a side job um I have a degree in psychology so I worked with uh, uh testing and measurement um psychologist called applied psychometrics so I worked for a, a two therapists to do uh, measurement analysis um, with my degree in psychology I also waited tables I loved waiting tables um, I waited tables you know on and off most of my adult life um, till I was about 35 I think 34 um, all through grad school you know and and also to balance out that ego of like, I'm a dancer. I, I said, I want to be with a public where they don't even know who I am. So I worked at Extraordinary Desserts just for fun. <laughs> Get a little extra money and just be Terry Wilson and not Terry Wilson, the, the professional modern dancer. <laughs> so there was always that, you know, balance for me. The ego part was always challenging for me. Of course, I wanted to be beautiful and everyone say I was beautiful. Of course, that right. But then there was a part of me that really did some self-reflection on that a lot. So I would say yes, 
you should have a side job. Um, you can have a side job that is linked to dance. To dance. Um, or it could be side uh, it could be a side job that allows you to have a different identity, which is also really good too, because you don't want to just have one identity in your life that you're attached to. Mm -hmm. um, because the, all of those things go away as you age, all of those <laughs> identities change. And what you're left with <laughs> is this aging process, which you don't want to have as your identity. <laughs> and so it's really good to, to know that you can recreate yourself in different places. Um, I liked being Carrie Wilson, the waitress sometimes, you know, because I was funny and I, I entertained <laughs> people. And I love bringing them food and make sure they have everything, you know, like sort of the nurturing part of me. Um, so yeah, I would recommend finding something that you can do to help support yourself because the other piece of that question is that there is no um, guarantee that you are going to get paid as a dancer because the economic um, climate in, in any given year can be very different as we are dramatically experiencing right now with COVID-19. But I will say, again, I never danced for Jean for free. No matter what was happening economically, she found a way to pay her dancers. So um, that comes from good management, yeah, good business management and persistence and perseverance, which is are uh, the top qualities of that woman for sure. Okay, what's next? Um, so oh, yeah. <laughs> I this is something that I always wonder, like how can you balance the life of being a mother and an artist especially like a dancer because like you literally have to use your body to like make art yeah. so yeah i don't know i always think about this and like how how do you manage that and what are some struggles well, with it so th the thing that they're going to tell you with pregnancy is that you can do what you do um almost all the way through your pregnancy um, so if you're a dancer and you're dancing all the time, it's not a problem. I mean, unless you have something wrong with your, you know, <laughs> some other condition related to your pregnancy, mm -hmm. you can do whatever you did. Like, you know, if you're a runner when you're pregnant, you can run up to a certain amount months, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important for the woman and that identity issue that we just talked about to keep, to not let the pregnancy be the only identity that she has. Um, so if you're a dancer and you're training all the time and performing all the time, you can keep doing that. Um, uh, Jean and Nancy, Jean Isaacs and Nancy McCaleb were very, very generous with all of us. Uh, uh, Faith Jensen and they had four babies during her career. I had okay. one. Tani Summertino had two. Um, so, uh, those are the people that come to mind that were in the company and had babies. We were both pregnant in Mazatlan when we were performing down there. <laughs> oh, wow. Which means no margaritas, sadly. Oh. but. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, yeah. Anyway, so usually it doesn't prohibit you from performing until you really are really, really showing. Mm -hmm. um, and even then you can also costume yourself. Um, and then I've seen lots of massively pregnant women on stage because it is so incredibly beautiful. So it depends on the choreographer um, mm -hmm. and of course the pregnancy, but um, I don't think it's an, a reason not to, to, not to have a child. And um, I was recently reminded, let's see if I can remember this. I was recently reminded by um, someone who's trained with me all the way through when I was not um, a mother and, and then became a mother. And I said, you're not really a modern dancer until you have a child, because then you really find your power. And I believe that because I was not the dancer. I was a completely different dancer afterwards mm -hmm. than I was before. And it became, came, came with that idea of the nurturing, the power that you have when your body as a woman is, repro is reproducing. I mean, that sounds so biological, but there's, <laughs> there's a power there. I mean, there was a power there. You know, you just don't want to mess with mama bear kind of thing, you know, <laughs> and then to channel that into performance. I was fearless. After I had Olivia, I was the most powerful I ever was. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, it's uh, different for everybody, you know, getting your body back, but usually you go right back into it and um, running around after a toddler burns a lot of calories. <laughs> and I was the most slender and it didn't, I didn't, didn't take any, any kind of effort on my part. As soon as I had Olivia, I, my body went back. I was in grad school, so that's different. I was mm. dancing a lot. Uh, my body went back right away, um, and it was the easiest time for me to stay slender and powerful. I don't know why. The hormones, I couldn't tell you why. <laughs> I was 35, 35 years old. But I would say having a 
having a baby changed the way I performed and changed the my relationship to myself because me and my body made this baby right like we were power <laughs> and I um you have different relationships with your body right and that really connected me to my my power so I would say there are lots of reasons why women are afraid to have babies because they're dancers I mean and I get that it's scary but I would say from my experience and the dancers that I you know, came through um my era my generation of dancers they all were just incredible performers afterwards. Faith had four girls. Boom, boom, boom. Bam. In between, just, you know, amazing dancers. <laughs> so powerful. And nothing knocked her back, that's for sure. So um, I say have babies. You know, it's, you know, I mean, it's something more to manage, but um, it doesn't mean you have to stop. It doesn't mean that your body's never going to come back. Absolutely not. So um, and each woman has to make those decisions. And they, I can say that to a woman and she can believe me or not believe me because she's having her own um, experience and her, her own fears mm -hmm. inside her body about that. I know women that don't want to have babies because it's going to change their body. And I'll tell you, man, my body was so much more powerful <laughs> afterwards. So I don't know. Uh, I get it. It's very personal, very personal um, uh, and just consideration. To follow follow that up um so what would be like the quote-unquote perfect time to have to start a family um based on like where your career is because yeah, I that's a also like if you're having this momentum of like getting gigs and having a client or whatever and then you suddenly have to stop for a while and then it's hard to get back on like I, I don't know it's just something that comes to mind well, you know, I didn't stop choreographing and producing shows when I was pregnant. I remember I was, you know, eight months pregnant, nine months pregnant, and I was, you're actually pregnant for 10 months. Just like, they always say nine months. It's always <laughs> longer. But anyway, um, <laughs> I mean, that's a premature, but like, anyway, I was, we produced, I was producing, running lights, doing costumes, you know, well, up to the time I had the baby. Then I had the baby and I moved back to Cal to Michigan and went to grad school and that was she was born in October I started grad school in January she went to class with me um <laughs> so the perfect time to have a child um okay you would want if you were going to get married or if you're in a relationship a committed relationship you know um you want to have really good meaningful conversations with your partner um I wasn't married uh, I was a single parent and the father left right you know pretty close to after right of that and so um, that wasn't my case. So it was just me, but, um, uh, those are considerations that you have with another human being, your, your, your partner. Mm -hmm. Um, there's lots of reasons not to have a baby. Oh, we don't have enough money. I certainly didn't have any money. None. I mean, I was the poorest, <laughs> I had the most powerful, strong body, but I had about <laughs> no money. <laughs> we used to get it. Olivia and I, she was like one and we would get one carne asana burrito and we'd cut it up and that's what we'd eat all day. When I first got out of grad school, I was incredibly broke, but, you know, very happy because I was dancing and I had a kid and it was, and it was California. So <laughs> those are three very good ingredients <laughs> and good. I have very, very, very good friends. That's not on this questionnaire, but I have the best friends. Oh. I have the best friends. Um, so perfect time is really a personal thing. I would say that happens with the woman, um, you know, uh, and with the spouse or the partner. Um, uh, and yeah, there's a lot of reasons not to have a kid. There's too many people on the planet. I'm afraid of my body. I'm afraid I'll get sick. What if the baby dies? What if I die? What, what if we don't have enough money? You know, what if we're bar terrible parents? Like, <laughs> it's like a <laughs> major, major head trip. Um, so, uh, it's a pretty, that's a personal question. Um, that, um, it's a hard question, really. I don't, yeah. I don't know the answer to it. I'm very glad I did it. I wasn't planning on doing it. And yeah, <laughs> I finally I had a baby. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, Terry, can we go ahead and take a break? And then when we come back, we're going to talk about your professor life. Okay, we're back. <laughs> uh, and we're Terry, back. What motivated you to pursue an MFA in dance? 
Okay, this is a good question. Uh, this goes back to the piece of like really listening to who you are and what what is what piece of dance really speaks to you the most. And I really knew that I loved teaching. Um, I also loved being in college and I had been out of college for about six or seven years at that point. And a professor from the University of Michigan would come. Oh, that's a whole nother story too, because he's from San Diego. And then he <laughs> became a professor in Ann Arbor. And then my parent, my mom lived there. So she was, he was friends with my mom. And then he would come in to Michigan or to San Diego and, and <laughs> teach for us many, many, many years, years and years. Bill DeYoung was his name. And he kept saying, Terry, come to Ann Arbor. I'll give you a scholarship to University of Michigan. So I went to grad school in Michigan um, uh, uh, on a full scholarship. Oh, wow. And Olivia had just been born. So I started in January. And um, these things are really, it was good because my mom and both my sisters were in Michigan at that time, so helping me with Olivia. But um, I knew that I wanted to teach. And I had this opportunity to study at Michigan and go home um, and not pay. <laughs> well, I mean, it was ex it's expensive to live there, so there's that, but not paid tuition. Mm -hmm. So the, again, things aligned for me and I went. Um, and it was an amazing experience. It was definitely the best thing. One of the best things I ever did was get my MFA in dance. I had a blast, even in the conditions, no husband, you know, little infant child, had to wait tables. I mean, even in all those like kind of stressors, I, it was wonderful. Grad school was wonderful. Oh, and, and so- And I knew I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, yeah, right. so for those that are listening and don't know, the requirements to be a college professor is like the highest you can get, correct? Right, well, okay, so this is different in different institutions. In the community college system in California, you have to have um, minimum qualifications are a master's degree. Mm -hmm. um, you can, um, depending on which college you're going to, community college, you're going to uh, become a, pro a professor um, by what they call um, professional equivalency. Mm -hmm. so for example, all those years of dancing and teaching could, if I compartmentalize it properly, also add up to an MFA. Mm -hmm. um, which I kind of agree with and don't agree with because when you go get your master's degree or PhD, whichever those higher degrees are, um, you do a lot more research. You do a lot more in-depth reading and research than you do as being, you know, I mean, it depends on the person, I guess, but mm -hmm. you, you know, you focus deeply on something, a specialty or an aspect of dance that's important to you. So you, um, you, can, you can teach at UCSD, you can teach at San Diego State without an MFA but you mm -hmm. have to have that professional equivalency. Um, having the MFA start you off at a pay scale, uh, you know, that is comparable to the amount of time that you've put into your education, whereas professional equivalency, you, have to, you would have to bargain at what salary you would start at. So walking in with an MFA, you start at something and you build from there and your salary can increase over the years um, in different ways. So that depends, it depends on the institution. You know, you don't have to have an MFA. Um, but it's, it's definitely, it puts you in a position where um, you, it might be, you get weeded out right away if you don't, you know, you could get weeded out of the yeah. application process for now. That would call it minimum qualifications. If you don't meet minimum qualifications on an, on an application, it says right away, does not meet minimum qualifications. So if you have 150 applications and not, um, 140 of them have MFAs and the other 10 don't have MFAs, you probably are not looking at those 10. And you're going to look at the other ones because that's a lot of people to look through, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I recommend it because I love school. I love studying. Um, you know, I, I, I still like to get my PhD, but I'm right now, I'm not sure exactly what that focus would be. Mm -hmm. So you don't do your PhD until you know what you really want to research because it's a very in-depth research um, process. Yeah. So maybe that'll come to me. Maybe it won't. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> So what should we look into while researching MFA programs? Because for my understanding, that's something that it's really focused yeah, um, versus true. like an undergraduate program as well. So, Right. It's similar um, to undergraduate, what we talked about earlier about like finding that fit, that chemistry. That's also mm -hmm. really important. But MFA programs will have specific focuses. Mm -hmm. You know, 
And so you, if you don't want to study dance theater, then don't go to a school that emphasizes dance theater. Mm -hmm. If you want to get an MFA in, um, you know, somatics, then you would look at an, a program that's focusing on somatics or postmodern or whatever their focus is. Mm -hmm. Again, and it's like knowing who the professors are, what they want to do. A uh, class size is important, I think, in, in a master's program, because obviously if there's more students, there's less one-on-one um, -on -one, um, time with your professors. Uh, there were three, four of us in my MFA. Hang on, I got a cramp on my foot. Woo. <laughs> um, that's called dehydration. That's oh, part no. of aging. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, we're four, four of us in our MFA program. I was the only one that had danced professionally. Everybody just comes straight out of their BFA right into their uh -huh. MFA, which I don't recommend. I don't recommend that. Okay. You get your BFA or your BA, do some professional work, kind of like what you're doing, like going mm -hmm. out there and making things happening in the community. Um, you're much going to get more out of your program and you're going to look better on an application for a master's program because you've done those things versus coming straight out of BFA. Mm -hmm. And you're a little bit older, a little bit more mature, a little bit more uh, focused on things. Um, that's not for everybody. Some people come right out of high school really focused. Like, I don't mean to be rude in any way, but I'm just <laughs> saying like, the more time on plant, uh, planet, the more you actually have to be in the, uh, the field of dance, the more you're going to be able to specialize in your MFA and get out of it what you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you, you have to really look at who's there. You know, there's a lot of pieces to it. Like when you're in an MFA program, you pretty much don't do anything else. Having a kid and, and waiting tables, that was a lot to manage. I, there are certain things I couldn't do as a student because I had um, those other things going on in my life. I don't recommend having a child in the same month that you go to grad school, but I did it. <laughs> <laughs> it was fine. You know, she was, Olivia was the, um, the pride of the dance department. She came to school with me. I breastfed Aww. her at the ballet bar. Everybody loved her. <laughs> um, everybody remembers her. How, how's Olivia? <laughs> um, so she was the coveted baby on campus at that time. But anyway, I don't recommend that, but I still loved every minute of it. And I think I really benefited from it, from it. Um, but again, it's the same thing as like finding that, that chemistry, that alignment, looking at the faculty, what they've done, who is going to inspire you, who's going to support you. Uh, you know, um, there are lots and lots and lots of professors, maybe not dance professors that have their own focus and they don't want to have anything to do with you, but they're in that position to kind of be your your counselor or whatever they're only interested in doing what they want to do and think about what they want to think about you don't want to go there you want to go someplace where you're going to get attention um, mm -hmm. you know guidance um, mentorship um, uh, connections to that existing community when I went back to Ann Arbor I started dancing for the professional company there called Ann Arbor Dance Works right mm -hmm. away because they knew I was coming into town I was a professional dancer and right away I started dancing for that company like I really benefited from those kinds of things so when I teach an advanced level class at UCSD, I do a thing called a regional study. And I tell the student, um, go, if you wanna go somewhere to dance, research everything about that place. That's Where funny. is it safe? Where is it not safe? How are you gonna get around? Do you need a trolley card? Do you need a subway card? Can you have a car? Where, you, where will you park your car? What kind of room, room can you afford? Where will you work? Can you speak the language? You know, you pick, you know, Lyon Ballet, you gotta, speak French right so like, <laughs> uh, you want to go to Paris you got to figure out some of those things right so um, that's the kind of focus that you want to have when you choose your undergraduate or your graduate work and definitely your PhD work right it's very mm -hmm. specific so knowing who you are right what you want to do with your dance degree and then researching where the best fit is now some of us can't afford to go anywhere else right we need to stay where we are and take advantage of what we what we have in our own community and that's another kind of perseverance, okay? Mm -hmm. These are my limitations. I need to stay in San Diego. This is what's happening in San Diego. I'm going to make the best of these places, right? You got to go in there knowing that maybe there's a missing piece there because you can't leave this region financially, mm -hmm. family reasons, whatever. Um, and so then having the perseverance and the knowledge of uh, creating what may not be happening for you, making that happen for yourself. Mm -hmm. So those are two really important ways of looking at um, pursuing an MFA, right? Yeah. For some of us, it's no-brainer, right? We know we've got to go on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, so because you're 
kind of in that realm. Uh, how competitive is it right now um, in the to become like a college professor in dance? Okay, so um, when I looked at this question, this is a generational question. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, let's take San Diego State for example. Uh, those professors, George Willis, Patricia Sandback, Melissa Nunn, Graham Hempel, they all retired within, they were all about the same age. They dominated that program for, I want to say 30 years, maybe more. I don't know math. I don't know the history that much <laughs> um, to be specific. There were no positions, right? You would come and go as an adjunct, and, but you would not move into a professor position because those people were solid. They went through the, the whole um, review committee sequence of earning their professor status, and they dominated that, that campus for many, many years. So when they retired, because they were all about the same age, then the entire San Diego State culture shifted, and we got Joe Alter and Leslie Siders and, and Jeff Humphreys, and, mm -hmm. and everything shifted completely. Mm -hmm. So there's an ebb and a flow, right? Um, uh, also, I would say um, your spirit, your generosity of spirit, if you're not a professor or you're not an adjunct part-time person at a college, community college or um, university college, how much are you contributing to your um, community? Because when they do have an opening, they're going to go, oh, this person can come and substitute. And you start to build your relationship with the institution that way mm -hmm. because you're consistent in the community, which I would mm -hmm. say you have that quality, right? Like I'm already turning to you to help me with some things um, in my career mm -hmm. to make uh, my college students have a better experience. So um, if you if there are not opportunities within the colleges that you want to teach at or in the area that you want to live, then you make yourself very available. <laughs> yeah. I can help you with this. I can help you with this. I hear these are work that I'd like to do. I'd like to use some of your dancers from your, your, your program. Um, you know what I mean? Creating those relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a pretty decent community in San Diego right now. The climate is very hostile, but mm -hmm. normally it's uh, very fluid and everybody loves each other normally. <laughs> not right now, but, um, uh, there's a lot of give and take people dance for many different people, you know, and they're all really wonderful people um, doing wonderful things. So um, that being a part of that and having a visibility in the community uh, is gives you um, may open the door for you to work at a college. Um, that's how I got my job at state. I mean, at city, at mm. city college. I, I was in, I, I had my, I knew I was going to get my MFA. Alicia Rincon knew I was going to get my MFA. And she said, when you're done, I want you to come back to San Diego and work for me. Oh, wow. So I had a job walking out of, with my diploma in my hand. I walked into a job. Oh, I mean, I didn't make that much money. It was the burrito <laughs> days. <laughs> the one burrito a day <laughs> between oh. the two of us. I didn't make a lot of money, but I had a job walking out of college. So, um, you know, because Alicia knew that I'd been in the community for a long time. We had done gigs together when my when I was in my twenties. Um, those were fun days, man. We had a good time, mm -hmm. and um, you know, she she knew that I had contributed enormously to the community in San Diego, and she wanted me, and she knew I was getting my MFA, so she plucked me right out of there. <laughs> so that's a really good example of you know how you can kind of pave your own way by having that reputation of being consistent and generous and work, working hard, like always saying yes. Mm -hmm. I try to tell my students, say yes, because yes is a word where possibility happens. You say no, then that door closes. Mm -hmm. And I've seen dancers, better dancers than me, maybe even better teachers than me, say no to things and lose gigs at, at UCSD. I've seen that happen. Oh, wow. Because if you say no to somebody, then they go to the next person and that person says yes to everything. And then all of a sudden, you've been there for 25 years. That's kind of what happened to me at UCSD. Because mm -hmm. I said yes. I always said yes. And I made it work. I mean, you know, okay, so we want to get into like, now I'm, don't know what, <laughs> now I need to start saying no, because I'm exhausted. But it's like, <laughs> so there's a balance in there. But in the beginning, say yes. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. So talking about balances, uh, how can you compare the demand of work between a professor slash choreographer and a dance performer? That's a good question. Um, it's really hard. Um, and I'm, I'm looking back at my career 
and how things have changed. And I'm looking back now at my career as a professor and what I decided to focus on, you know, and some things I missed. There's some things I, I mean, I can still do it. I'm not saying I can't do it, but some, some pieces of that I missed because I was focused on uh, other things, um, trying to broaden my perspective. So uh, being a specialist in dance is, it really is a specialty. You really need to, you have to keep producing, keep choreographing, keep teaching, um, you know, um, yeah, it's a hard, it's a very, very hard balance. So if you, a, a lot of people ask me for many years, Terry, why don't you have a dance company? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I can't have a dance company because I can't pay my dancers. I've done, produced my own professional work, but I pay out of pocket, right? I pay for the studio rental. I pay for the, wherever I, the performance venue and I pay for rehearsal. I don't like I, my, my uh, ethic, my work ethic is you don't ask people to do things for free. Mm -hmm. So that's the dominant reason why I never had a dance company. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a dance company like San Diego Dance Theater, you have to be consistently writing grants so that the work that you're doing is funded. Your I, um, different programming that you want to, your co company to participate in. But, okay. So, um, when you get to that level where you actually are a professor and you are a choreographer and you are, I mean, a dancer. So let's see. Um, for me, uh, I was a performer in a professional company and a dance adjunct. Um, and by the time I became a professor, I wasn't dancing professionally anymore. And in there, I was producing my own work pretty infrequently, but, you know, I still was producing my own work. Because when you're in college, you do concerts with your students, um, so you're working a lot. And then I taught in the summer workshops at San Diego Dance Theater, so I was producing work there. I did do some of my own professional work over the years. Um, I probably produced maybe four or five concerts uh, since around, I don't know, 2008 or so. And uh, also being involved in professional things like trolley dances and stuff, uh, I was able to balance all of that out. But when you become a full-time professor, you have other administrative um, uh, obligations, uh, being a part of the campus culture. Uh, and there are certain professors that can just walk on and, and do their job and leave and have no uh, input to the, the culture of the, of the campus. But that's not my nature. My nature is to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge part of the culture at City College. And um, I, um, I'm very proud of that. But it, it takes a lot to do all of the things that you're asking, like, so I'm not performing professionally anymore. Uh, I'm making some uh, professional choreography with San Diego Dance Theater, and that's kind of a bonus right now for me. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say it's very tricky to do all three of those things at the same time. People do it. They do do mm -hmm. it. But it's a lot. And to do things well, you need to focus on, on certain things, yeah. um, which I would say is part of my hindsight, um, uh, is that, you know, had I... I had I could have done more for City College when I started as a professor, um, a full time professor. But what I focused on was building the seeds at uh, seeds at City Urban Garden. I was a big part of that. I was one of the first people that broke ground on that seeds at City, which become an, an, a complete program on itself. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with dance, but we did <laughs> dance in there. I got to find that footage. I have a, a DVD <laughs> of Zikia Salinas dancing <laughs> in the seeds at City um, Garden. So when I look back, I could have done more for the program and focusing on the program. And what I did focus on was making that garden because I, I was a part of the environmental stewardship committee. It was very important to me as my culture at school to take care of the climate um, and the environment. So, yeah. So that's just one example of like you can really go down uh, different pathways where you really get invested, um, mm -hmm. especially in a college college culture. The campus does a lot of different things. And so now kind of my relationship with the campus is that I, I do like meditation and yoga for lots of different things, lots of different events. They call me, can you do this? And I say, yes, there's another yes. But mm -hmm. balancing out being a choreographer, being a performer and being a professor is, I mean, I don't know who does that actually, but at that time you get your professorship, you usually maybe not be performing professionally anymore, but yeah, it is, um, it's not undoable, but it, it, you know, to do everything well, you know, it takes time. Mm -hmm. I'm not say you can't, but you, but you, it's a lot of focus to balance all of that out. So, yeah. So what are some opportunities that you have received as a college professor that a dance company could not offer you? 
Well, it kind of links to what I was just saying, like being a part of a greater, uh, a greater good, like the campus is edu- being a part of education. That's the answer to that question. Mm. Okay. Because yeah, you're an educator as a dance teacher in a dance studio, but to be a part of a person's pathway to their education, which I believe in deeply, um, is, uh, it's really a, a great honor. Uh, it's an incredible investment. I mean, you're an example of that. To see you be so successful, <laughs> there is nothing better. I mean, I have a child. I love my child, but I also love that the students are like you are doing what you want to do and you're truly invested in what you want. I'm, being a part of that is a huge privilege. And that's the, that is a differentiation about City College, uh, other places that I worked. I, I've worked at, I don't want to say, but Okay, we got caught up once again, but it's okay. So uh, let's pick up where we left off. Um, you were talking about how seeing your... What opportunities. Mm-hmm. And you were just... Okay. Wanna, yeah. Go ahead. And you were just saying how... Sorry. What? <laughs> <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Oh, I just really wanted, it was important to me to make sure that um, a part of this conversation was um, what opportunities um, I've, I've received as a class of college professor that a dance company would not offer. And uh, the distinction between those two is making art and, and uh, part being an uh, arts educator and being an educator is incredibly rewarding to watch your students grow and uh, become fascinated and watch their curiosity blossom into an actual dance career is the most rewarding thing. I mean, I, you know, I love my daughter. She's amazing, but this is very close to that. Like seeing your students succeed, uh, seeing them being excellent human beings and citizens of the world and using dance as a, you know, a bridge for that is it, there's nothing better than that. That's why everybody loves it so much. Right. If you have that mm-hmm. right intention. So yeah. Um, that's, that's one of the benefits that you might not get from a dance company, but in, as a dance company, you see people grow, um, in different ways as artists, which is also really rewarding. Um, but, I, but I find that education is, um, connects the student or the person to a lot of different things that they can become beyond the artist, or, you know, choreographer, dancer, artist, whatever. There's more there for them to choose from and to put into their pile of their toolbox of things to use as they become a human being, right? As they grow into mm-hmm. their whatever citizenship, whatever I'm trying to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to finalize everything, um, how do you see your career evolve in the next five to 10 years? <clears throat> well, if you had asked me that, you know, um, a year ago, I would say that I would take over the, the artistic direction of San Diego Dance Theater. Um, but that's in question for me right now. Um, I would say it's very, I'm very close to retirement at both UCSD and City College. And mm. I'm hoping to come back. Yeah, I know, it's sad. I'm hoping <laughs> to come back as what we call um, pro rata. So I can come back as a part-time um, mm. teacher, but I wouldn't be the full-time professor. I wouldn't be the head of dance. Um, I can still contribute to the to the campus in the same ways that I do now, but I wouldn't have uh, those other opportunities. Um, but yeah, retirement's very close for me. I have some great colleagues that can definitely take the helm at City. Um, it's just a difficult question because of COVID nineteen. But um, mm-hmm. I'm fifty eight, so I would say I ideally I would stay till I was sixty five, um, and then I would have twenty years experience. Um, that being said, I've seen people wait till they were 65 to retire. And then after they retired, they got sick and some of them passed away. And I don't want that to be my, my story. So mm. I want to have some time to watch Olivia get married and have children and uh, have a garden and, uh, you know, uh, be with my husband and travel a bit. Um, so I want to balance that out. Um, I'm not quite sure how to do that now that we're in COVID-19, but you know, I'm very happy to have my job right now. Very happy and very lucky. Um, so I would say in an ideal situation, I would probably retire when I 60, 61, maybe 62. Um, and then I would go back part-time at City. And then uh, my dear colleagues at City College would be then my boss, which would be great because they're amazing. <laughs> and then we would can keep, keep, keep building what we've been, what we've created at City, which is the beautiful dance community that we have. Um, mm-hmm. So that I would go back. I wouldn't be completely gone. I'm never 
I'm going to be completely gone. Although there is a rumor that I may move to Crete. <laughs> what? Um, Crete is Crete is the southern island in Greece, and it is amazing. Oh. And you know, my husband and I often say we're going to move to Crete. <laughs> so that's sort of a, uh, my my joke. But anyway, so five to ten years. In ten years, I'll be sixty-eight. So I will be retired, um, probably almost completely at that point. In five years, I'll probably be pro rata at City. Um, somewhere in there, I may be artistic director of San Diego Dance Theater if the company survives uh, COVID-19 and the other aggr aggressions against them. Um, so uh, I would like to, I would continue to help with San Diego Dance Theater and the community and da uh, the dance community in general. I will continue mm -hmm. to do that until I'm not around anymore. So it'll start to taper for me, I would say, um, and rightly so. And I look forward to that because it's hard to sustain this much energy um, consistently and do a great job and meet everybody's mm -hmm. needs and um, make everybody happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I want to, I would like to leave my, my career on a note where people would want to spend more time with me than boot me out the door. I've seen that happen too. <laughs> mm -hmm. They couldn't wait till I left. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to be the case. I would say, Oh, you know, I would rather them miss me than wish me gone. So. Yeah, you have to be sensitive to that as well when your time has come and you can pass the, the baton to the more capable um, people that work for me now and people like you coming up through um, the educational um, uh, degree programs that you get your MFA. I know you will. So, I mean, eventually I'd like to say come and dance at City and be a teacher there. I mean, be a teacher at City. And I, you know, I do say that to some of my people that I love so much. And, and you know, that would be the crowning joke glory of my educational career to see you come and be a full-time oh. professor at City College. So <laughs> I will be I will be around to help facilitate those things um, but you. I may not be full-time <laughs> all the time um, and not, if I go anywhere it'll be Crete that's very far away. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is just a joke. <laughs> I, have to be near, I have to be near an ocean. My husband and I like yeah. to swim so wherever it will be San Diego is a really good place to retire it's quite expensive but Mm -hmm. it's where my heart is and my great <laughs> friends and my great students so my colleagues <laughs> oh thank you so much for being here terry i You're welcome. feel like this is such an important like conversation to have and just because this is reality and people i think they have different um expectations of how a dancer's career kind of looks like so yeah yeah, I think it, it, it's such an important thing to kind of um, talk about, especially for young people thinking mm -hmm. of um, having like a dance career, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of factors involved. And I, 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 I like to tell my story to my, dan my students because I didn't start dancing when I was a little kid. I didn't have mm -hmm. the ballet training, the little pink tutu and all that stuff that you kind of dream about as a young little girl, I would, some people anyway. Um, I didn't have that and I, I was self-made so the joke now is that I was a great athlete now I'm a great dancer or I was a great dancer and um <laughs> so I mean there's different pathways for everybody you know and some of it has to do with your constitution and your your basic characteristics of work ethic and values so you got it you got it work it mm -hmm. <laughs> stay with it <laughs> persevere <All right. laughs> If you're listening to this, um, I think school already had started. So um, please, in the spring, if you can in San Diego, take classes at uh, San Diego City College because the programs there are really good for everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I you. really recommend. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Terry, so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Alexa. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, future Alexa here. I forgot to tell you, please follow my social media. I'm at the Dance Resource Podcast almost everywhere. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, um, Pinterest, I'm on YouTube as well. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Resource Dance over there. And if you want to leave me a voice message, you can go to my Anchor account. Please go to anchor.fm slash dance research podcast. And you can click there. There's a message button. You can record a message and you can be featured here on my podcast. 
All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next week. Bye bye.